You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagoye Dillin and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Body Banter. My name is Claudia Krebs, and I'm joining you from the ancestral, unceded territory of the Musqueam Nation, also known as the UBC Vancouver campus. And I'm joined here, of course, by Shigun. Hi, how are you? Hi, Claudia, and hello, everyone. And uh, my name is Shagun Yedili, and I'm joining you from Kelowna, which is located in the uh, traditional ancestral territories of the Silks Okanagan Nation on the campus of uh, the UBC Okanagan campus. Today, we have a very special guest uh, with us, uh, who is our uh, body banter guest today. Um, Leonard, do you please want to introduce yourself? So I'm Leonard uh, Shapiro, and I'm from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And um, likewise, as a white South African of this particular age that I am, of 62, uh, I came here via my grandparents and my parents to South Africa. We live through apartheid, and absolutely I acknowledge um, what's happened here in our country, the suffering that's happened. Uh, It's still 20 years into democracy has effect on our country in terms of uh, poverty and uh, health care and many things that are still uh, being sorted out and dealt with. Um, But I completely acknowledge the privilege that I had uh, to have an education um, and to be able to go to university. And without that, I think I actually wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. Welcome, Leonard. Um, what a what a touching introduction. Thank you for that. Um, you touched upon bodies already as you talked about this and how in your country um, bodies were treated differently uh, based on their background and the melanin content of their skin. Um, how has that shaped your relationship with bodies and your body of work? Wow. Well, I mean, in terms of the discrimination in South Africa, uh, black bodies were, I mean, we were not allowed to walk with different races. So I was not allowed to walk with someone who had a different skin. Let's forget about even race, different skin color from myself. If you did, people would kind of look at you. Um, And in terms of healthcare, I mean, there was huge disparities of healthcare. I remember in 1980, six at university where pamphlets were completely banned. I mean, it was a police state and possessing certain information would land, could land you in jail without trial. And I remember reading something at the age of 26 and I opened this pamphlet on campus and um, I saw this photograph, a black and white photograph, remember, no digital media or anything. It was a black and white photograph of mounds of earth with these tiny graves and tiny coffins. It must have been 20. And the, they had all these children had died of malnutrition. That's all they had died from. And so in terms of bodies being different, bodies were very different. You know, we were, everyone was treated very differently to healthcare, et cetera. Um, so that was my relationship to bodies growing up. But uh, um, South Africa has been through such a massive transition that it's almost impossible for me to even think back to how it actually was, where you had separate entrances in shops. It's almost, it's like impossible. And people who are born now into this generation, um, you know, post-apartheid, they cannot, they, they cannot imagine what it was actually like. It's not possible for them. Thanks, Leonard. That's, um, 
that's deeply moving. I, I, you may or may not know that I lived in, in Joburg myself for 10 years. Yeah, I did. I didn't know that. Yes, I did. And so I'm very familiar with the stories that you're, that you're telling. And, um, and, and so, um, you know, and, and maybe sometime outside of the podcast, you and I will, will, will chat a bit more about that. But bringing it back to, to these discussions that we're having uh, about the bodies and, and your relationship with the body. So you told us that, of course, you had an education and, and you, went to, uh, you went to university. So what's your line of study and how has that evolved in terms of your relationship with the body? I'll tell you. So I went, I went, I first did social sciences. Okay. After that degree, I, eight years later, I went and studied fine art. And we had to draw at least twice a week for, I think, twice or three times a week for two hours at a time. We had to draw nude bodies, the, the, the naked, you know, the life models, they call it. And so that was, my, I suppose, my introduction to the, the human body. Um, and then, Going forward now many years, so that was I was 28 then, going forward till about 15, I had a I made a decision. I had a, I made a decision that I didn't just want to draw and make pretty pictures. I want to actually do something with my skills that could benefit humankind. I know that sounds very romantic and cliche, but it was actually a, something that happened to me. It took about a three-week process. And I thought, well, what, can, what do you do? What can you do? And I teach observation, deeper observation and drawing. And then I thought to myself, well, what can you do with these skills to benefit humankind? I thought, well, if I can teach medical students and clinicians to observe better, you have better, you have better clinicians, better, better doctors, et cetera. From a, from a student uh, stage up. And incredibly, and you, as they say, and I'm not, uh, you know, I don't believe in all this stuff, you know, but as they say, you know, um, as, um, uh, what did they say? The, when you make a decision, the universe conspires to make it happen. And a week later, I got an email from uh, actually, Prof. Steve Reed, who's with Primary Healthcare at UCT. And he said, oh, you know, would you like to come and teach the students to draw as part of a course? So I went to see him. He spoke to me. He thought, oh, he's talking to an artist, quote unquote. And I thought to myself, yeah, I'm talking to a, um, you know, a scientist. But he was trying to impress me by being arty. And he started talking about both two different halves of the brain. And I actually had to say to him, well, actually, that's not really true. You know, having a left hand, uh, sort of a creative side and, you know, the drawing on the right side of the brain, it's, it's, it's actually just nonsense. And um, so then I said to him, well, why don't we, why don't we do a study on the effects of, of drawing? And with that, I remember he pulled out his ledger, it was a black ledger with, you know, red, binding and he started taking notes and that was the start of our very first paper which was published in anatomical sciences education and um, we still when he and I reminisce about that meeting we still joke with each other that you know I sort of put on a collar and a, a watch and a, a pen and everything to try and not play into his concept of what an artist is and he was trying to be, you know, left-hand side of the brain, creative and right-hand side, to try and be a little bit arty, you know. And uh, But then we met each other, as it were. You know, we met art and science together. In any case, I started teaching um, students to observe better. And I myself started engaging with the bones and wet specimens and drawing them. So I would take, you know, various bones and look at them and draw them. And of course, I was drawing them from a very primary point of view. If I had a humerus or a mandible, I would be observing it without any idea of the annotations and the functions. So I would be observing it in a very fundamental way. I like to think perhaps Vesalius um, and the early anatomists, some of whom we were introduced to, um, the other day at this uh, conference, 
would have been observing in that same way, you know, in a really fundamental way, without language, okay, without annotations, without labels on things. And so what you get then is a is a very is a real mental picture, a real mental understanding of the object that you are observing. Okay. And um, so then also, for example, when I wanted to understand the human heart from a gross anatomy point of view, I got, I remember I was given a bucket of uh, I think it was five or six wet specimens. I took them up to the lab and I looked at them and I thought, well, how am I going to observe this? Because they're very organic looking. How am I going to study this? And then it clicked. You need to draw the inside chambers. You need to draw um, uh, you know, the, the, the left atrium, the left ventricle, you know, the, the low aorta, that valve in between, the upper aorta, and all these chambers. And after doing that, I could literally shut my eyes and I could be a little ant and crawl around in there and understand that. And I could close my eyes right now and I can turn that very specimen that I was observing, of course, using touch, you see. That's not what I teach. I teach an observation method that uses haptics, that uses touch and drawing. So as you... I put my fingers in that heart and I was feeling, I was feeling the septum. Oh, it's thick over there. Oh, it's thin over there. Observing, learning. Oh, look, the aorta is like, oh, that doesn't collapse. The pulmonary collapses. Oh, that's very interesting. So real observation, not just from a, a textbook. So Leonard, and, this yeah. approach of yours is, um, it's so fascinating because it's this curiosity driven um, kind of touching and exploring the world almost like a child does as they go and they touch and they feel and honestly mm. children taste things as well which is why they do not go into the anatomy lab obviously for one of the many reasons but yeah. you know it's this very um connected and almost visceral way of observing the world and mm. i'm just thinking about this but you know i guess through our experience with covid and and all of that we have been so um dependent on our visual connections through screens and all of that and we lost our sense of touch a little bit as we were at the beginning of the pandemic and the height of the pandemic prohibited from touching each other even um, unless they were within our household right and so your way of exploring the the body in, in terms of these anatomical specimens through touch and the connection that you have to that um, really resonates with me can you Talk a little bit more about that connection. Uh, using touch and observation with the, of the human body? Absolutely, yeah, and how that connects you to, to the human. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, an example I, I, I had, which was a really powerful experience, I wanted to look at and understand something about the the uh, a body donor, someone who had donated their body, they're lying on the table. I wanted to to look at that and to and to observe that and to draw that and to try and understand something about that, aside from the physical structures. And so I remember I sat there on the stool, and there was this um, donor, and I everything was dissected but closed up. All the flaps were closed and I was just looking and looking and trying to draw and it wasn't working, it wasn't working. Drawing wasn't coming out right. And then I said, wait a minute, you need to put your hands in there. You need to get, you know, you need to engage more. And so I took this flap here, I don't know what you would call this flap, but I opened it, this, uh, the uh, 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 vertical, um, incision down the um, uh, down the sternum down, down the sternum and uh, uh, all the way down to you know the um, over there the, the abdomen thorax and abdomen so I opened it up and I went and sat down again and I started looking and drawing and then I noticed something because I was seeing now a human in a condition in a state that I'd never seen a person like that before, a state where a person is, is exposed on the inside and on the outside. I was seeing a human, I was seeing a face, I was seeing an individual. 
And um, just to go back, okay, so all right, so I was I was looking and drawing, and then I went and I put my hand, you know, on the um, on the intercostal muscles. So in a way, quite an intimate place to put your hand. It's like if you give someone a hug, you're not putting your hand inside them. But this was putting a hand between inside the skin and literally on, on the intercostal muscles. So that was like an intimate position. And I sat down and I just experienced, not through intellect, but through real sort of intuition or whatever, I experienced an absolute sense of wonder and awe about the amazement of this, the design, the engineering of this, what I was looking at. I won't even put a name to it. It was just a real experience. But I'll tell you something really interesting. When I undressed the body, when I took off the, uh, the first plastic, large plastic sheet in the muslin cloth, and then I took the individual uh, plastic off the off the legs and off the off the lowlands and off the upper limbs, off the legs and off the arms. I looked at the feet and I was like, ah, oh. I was like, I had that sort of yucky experience, you know. It's like in art speak they call it the abject, okay. But um, it was like, oh, that's not so nice. And I tell you something. After that experience of the absolute beauty and wonder of the body, of, of the engineering, of the brilliance, not from any religious point of view at all, mind you. When I dress the body again, I put those sleeves onto the feet, completely different experience of those same feet. It was like, I was filled with, I was filled with an experience. So that's, that's an experience. And I then took that experience. And in teaching students, I now, when I, when I teach them, I take them, we have a, a session of about three hours sitting around one body donor, if it's say 15 people. Looking, I take them on a, on a walk around first. So we all walk very slowly around and initially students will, they'll walk quite fast to kind of avoid, you know. <laughs> looking. I said, no, no, slow down, slow down. No, no, slower. And we walk and we just walk around and look and things become quite quiet. And then we sit. Everyone's got a stool and a board with paper on and uh, something to draw with. And we start drawing. And um, at some points we all swap chairs. So we have different perspectives. We start right. drawing from different perspectives. Eventually people get up and they start drawing. And right. then the next day, the next day we, we get a living person, a naked living person uh, who stands next to a teaching skeleton and turns around and does all kinds of things, you know, all kinds of postures yes. and positions. Yes. And that's drawing the living. And so, you know, you know where I'm going with this. I mean, yeah. it's... Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Leonard, because... Um, it's that feeling that you describe of, of the sense of wonder and awe. It was, it's uh, anyone who's been to the anatomy lab for the first time will describe similar feelings. And it's something that our students also describe every year when they're coming fresh as uh, fresh undergraduate medical students. And, and, and I was intrigued as, by something you said, how the, the perspective that you had with the, with the donor, um, like dissected and and without clothes was completely different when you then dressed the 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 donor and 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 um it reminds me of something how we it's possible to to depersonalize a, a donor a cadaver in the, in the lab as well as personalize the donor and and I'm and I'm wondering uh because it's something we we it's a balance that our students have described how mm -hmm. to do their job to actually learn they don't have they cannot completely be you know occupied with the feeling with that sense that oh oh this is you know and so that sense of the humanity of the person and yet mm -hmm. they need that sense in order to be able to not abuse the privilege of of uh, of working with the donor how do you strike that balance in your work um 
I, I'm not, I don't follow exactly what your question is. You see, you know, our students describe a feeling that is almost between the human and the clinical, all right? Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, okay. The, the, the sense that they need to be clinical to be able to right. do their job. You know, they can't be always thinking about the, the humanity of the individual that they are working on uh, right there because then they, 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 they don't have the freedom to be able to do what they need to do. And yet they cannot exist all the time in that clinical space because then they don't appreciate what the, what the real um, donor that uh, the gift that they've been given. So I was as asking how you strike the balance in that. In I, that. I understand now. Yeah. I don't think it's an either or. I think you can actually hold them both at the same time, but it will take, for a young person, it will take a growth until they can hold it at the same time, until they can hold the wonder and marvel of the human. And that I'm dealing with maybe a life-saving procedure and the person might die, you know, that you can hold both of those. And I was, I'm amazed at the students. I mean, these students are 21. And yet we were having amazing discussions about what is life. And they were so easy with the um, with the donor. They were not freaked out about it. They'd been through a whole year of dissection, and but but drawing, of course, and touching. So we have one glove on one hand and no glove on the other hand. So we can use one hand to touch where we need to and open things up and have a look. There was there was none of that. There was none of that. I don't know what word to use, that horror or that shock or whatever. I must say, the day before I went to do this exercise with them, I had this like, uh, I had this kind of, I was like dragging myself there. But once we started, the magic that unfolded, and of course, one has to facilitate these things. One has to facilitate these conversations or even unspoken conversations with students around um, Cadavers, because there's lessons they can learn that I cannot teach. They are normal lessons, you know, that happen. Mm. Yeah, Thank, thanks, Leonard. And I was, I guess, one follow up, and then I'll let Claudia um, go on to <laughs> with her with her question. Um, have you noticed any change over the years that you've done this? Like we we mentioned at the beginning, I'm not sure whether it was um, off the podcast or whether we had begun to. Um, record the post podcast then about how today's world is lot much more digital. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot more technology. Uh, people are much more occupied with the cell phones and so on. And so they are used to images, sometimes even graphic images um, online and so on and so forth. And so our students live in that environment. So I'm wondering, have you noticed any change or difference in the students that you had earlier on when the world wasn't this technologically advanced to the ones you have now, is there a sense of uh, detachment or, or engagement or, or is it more or less the same? No, I think students still appreciate the need to have the real thing there because when I teach them to touch and feel, and in fact, the students I taught recently, they had all studied the upper limb in great detail and I show, I, you know, we had humeruses there and we had uh, mandibles and we had skulls. And, but for example, we, we observed and drew, everyone observed and drew a humerus. And they all say, my goodness, I never noticed that. Oh, wow, look at that. Because I also, it's not that we just draw them in a very static way. We take them and we turn them. And we, as we're turning them, we draw. So we are... The drawings, by the way, are entirely secondary to the understanding, to the learning process. This is this is so something one really has to stress because a lot of people is like, I can't draw. Well, everybody can draw. We write, that's drawing. You scribble, that's drawing. You can move your arm, that's drawing. This concept that drawing is, um, you know, this hyper-realistic kind of thing that we are so used to seeing. That's not the kind of drawing we're talking about. We're talking about making marks, and marks have value, value to describe form, okay? And when you have those marks, when you're drawing, you are actually, those marks you, inform you. They inform the observer. 
uh, as to how accurately they are observing. It's very interesting that. It's very interesting because drawing marks are, are in the evolution of humankind. Marks came before speech. They came before writing. And so I often take the students and, if, you know, if someone's draw, been drawing, uh, observing and making marks to reflect what they're observing, I say to, to the person who has done the drawing, which part of that drawing do you like the best? And I know what they're going to point to. They point to, they say, that part. But why? Well, maybe they don't know. It's like, okay, is it, you know, and it, is it, if you close your eyes, can you see the entire hammer or humerus? I see that part better. And so that part they drew better is the part they observed better. It's a very complex thing, actually. I mean, it's simple, but it's, it's complex. I mean, it's a whole paper in itself. I love that. And one thing that really strikes me is taking time, taking time to observe, taking time to see, taking time to appreciate, taking time to connect. And, you know, our students, our entire world, you, I, everyone, we're always so stressed and strapped for time. We don't have time for this, that, and the other. Um, and taking this pause and touching, exploring, being open to the curiosity and to the observation, I think opens up this whole new appreciation and understanding. Um, you could get almost philosophical about this, right? How your approach to observation is really an approach to life. Is, yes. is it an approach to life for you as well? Yes, because in terms of my own body, it's incredible. I see my own body. The more I've observed and studied the anatomy, um, in, not in the way that students are learning it, but in my way of observing it, of getting engaged with it, of understanding, oh, my goodness, I thought the diaphragm was down here. Oh, it's all the way up there. Oh, my goodness. The top of the, um, of the liver is like right where the nipple is. Lots of discoveries because we grow up with these... Um, with these diagrams. I mean, and, and I was, you know, as a child, I actually did have that, um, that model that you drew with the plastic, you know, and you painted the veins and everything. I had that, I had that body and I had an eye and everything. So I don't know if that's, it has any significance, but, but we, we grow up thinking, looking at those diagrams and thinking, oh, everything is so nicely separate, but you open it up and you see, my goodness, the economy of space how things are fitted together and how small the lungs actually are. Whereas, you know, one imagines, because one, I guess I had thought about this the other day, one is breathing, one breathes, right? Which is so, it's such a vital thing to a human. And so when I breathe, my, I feel even my abdomen moves, right? So I imagine my lungs to be huge. But actually, I got a shock to see how small they are. And I just, I would imagine that if you did a survey and said, oh, how big are your lungs? People say, oh, they're about this big, but they're not, you know? So it's this embodied feeling and this embodied sort of appreciation of our own anatomy, um, what you just said about the lungs, you know, you breathe and your abdomen moves and, you know, how everything is connected reminds me of this interaction I had with a dancer. I was explaining balance to them and how, you know, the organ of balance is this tiny thing inside of your head, the labyrinth. And, you know, I was going on about that. And the dancer looked at me and was like, what are you talking about? I feel balance in my whole body. And it was a revelation to me because, you know, we often just kind of focus in on this tiny body part. And of course, that tiny body part all by itself does absolutely nothing. It's the connections with the rest of the body and the brain that define our sense of balance. So the embodied experience that balance is something you feel in your entire body is much more real than me explaining that there's a tiny thing in the inside of your skull that right. senses that and i think with the lungs what you're seeing it's it's so it's similar right the embodied feeling of your lungs being large and full of air and life and extending into your abdomen yeah. it's not completely wrong right no. like because that's how the mechanics of breathing in the end are going to work okay. yeah and there's another thing that correlates with what you were saying now claudia which i happened on me one day you know i thought about it 
there's the brain. Where's the brain? The brain's here. But every every nerve in your body comes from your brain and goes to your brain. And so I had this thought that um, the brain is in my whole body. You know, it's it extends to my whole body via the nerves. Which you know, I mean, people might balk at that. A neuroscientist, I don't know, they might say, "Oh, that's not that's ridiculous." But that's just my experience, you know, in terms of the holism of my my brain. And certainly, in terms of when we draw and observe with touch, the sensory cortex, the hand, the afferent nerves from the hand go to the sensory cortex. So when we observe something with touch. You don't even have to try and observe it automatically. This, this observation that you're doing goes immediately to the sensory cortex. And the marks we make with our other hand to reflect the gestures we make in here, so the gestures we make on the paper, um, are from the motor cortex. So it's there's a science to it as well, but it's just a method, I guess, that yeah. that. That happened. And Claudia, about time, about time, you were talking about um, how busy we are. The irony is, the irony is that, and it might sound like I'm trying to promote this, but if one learns this observation method, you'll actually save time. So you'll take up uh, some hours to learn it, but the result will be that your observation ability will be so improved that you could save a fortune of time studying as a student, you know? So that's just kind of an irony that one has to try and explain to the bureaucracies that design curricula. Absolutely. Right. You could say, I don't have time to hurry, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's, I, it's, it's been a fascinating discussion, Lena, and, and this is really, I, I particularly like the, image you put in, in my head when you said what like when you, when I feel I feel that my brain is in my whole body you know yeah. and that's actually true when you think of the homunculus um how mm -hmm. the body is represented in the brain in the motor and sensory homunculus so that's that's it's it's truer than we can imagine because it's actually true that the whole our brain is is felt in the whole body and vice versa the whole body is represented on the brain um, then trying to um, wrap up our discussion, Leonard, um, which has been a very fascinating one, we always like to ask our guests about their favorite body part. Uh, do you have any favorite body parts? Yes. So I like noses. Okay. Interesting. I like people's noses. And I like, I like sort of, I, I like French noses. <laughs> <laughs> and and I tell, like tell me more. <laughs> well, I like it's actually okay. This is this is maybe a bit embarrassing, but when I was a child, okay, I used to you know, a very small child. I would I would like take my mouth and then bite my father's nose, and so maybe that's why I like noses. Okay, and the other part I like are ears. I like earlobes, and I particularly like mine as well. And um, my grandmother always used to I remember when she um, she used to she used to play with her earlobe and I used to watch her. And I, I don't know. She used to do that. And I do it as well. So you asked the question. I and did. I, I, I like did. those. As, as, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's okay. amazing. Noses, French noses in particular, and earlobes. That... So I like not, not tiny noses. I like substantial noses. Yeah, no, that's great. I, <laughs> I really love that. Um, conversely, do you have a body part that you're not like that you're like, mm, not my favorite? Um, well, okay, so. Look, I, 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 I do nice things. I do, I'm happy I have hands and I do good things with my hands. Okay, I've got I'm good with my hands. But I don't particularly like my hands, my particular hands. Okay, my mother had exactly the same hands as me. And for that, that's amazing. She went to art school as well, you know, the same one I went to. But I couldn't believe it. I thought I've got such, well, she's actually got such masculine hands. I went quote unquote. 
put my hands on, and I, I would enjoy it to wear jewelry, but the jewelry doesn't look nice on me. So I buy jewelry for other people. It doesn't look nice on my hands. Um, there's not a part I don't like. It really isn't. I can't say that I, there's no part, I can't, I'll have to struggle to tell you. So I'm at peace with my hands because I would imagine that if I had really nice long fingers, I could draw better, but that's actually not true. <laughs> it's all practice. No, I, you should be so happy with your hands because of the things you create with them and the method that you've developed in touching things and understanding the world through your hands. So yeah. um, it's, it's not so much about the form, it's really about the function, right? And, and the things that you do with them. And yeah. uh, thank you, Leonard, for sharing uh, uh, your thoughts sure. and your, your insights. Um, mm. It's been just beautiful listening to you. I could listen to you for forever and we could have conversations around sort of the exploration of the body through touch and observation and how that connects us to um, the humanity of the body and that sense of magic, you said, that sense of wonder and awe um, that we should have and that we need to take time for it because it's important. I think it's really, I think it's really important to introduce that into the, the medical curriculum. Mm -hmm. I know people learn clinical skills, but it's often on a dummy, you know, and when we do another, there's another method of which we do, it's called body painting with palpation. Okay, so we, people, uh, students sit opposite each other and they, they um, flex and extend and twist their, you know, turn their, uh, rotate their upper limbs and they feel and then they paint on each other. And uh, I mean, you know, obviously there's, you know, you are exploring permission to touch and all of that. But I think students are fine and people are fine. There's so much around, oh, we can't touch. It's such a lot of nonsense. Oh, yeah. I mean. No, I agree. I think it's, uh, our sense of touch is so important and we, yeah. we are ignoring it. And as I mentioned earlier, the pandemic has encouraged us to ignore our sense of touch. So it's maybe time to reconnect and connect through touch, right? Great. Well Thank said, Claudia. Thank you so, you much, so much. Thanks. Thanks, Leonard, and um, really, really happy to to have talked with you today. To, uh, share your insights and um, your particular perspective about touch, and just like Claudia said, this has been fascinating. And uh, hopefully, we will get another opportunity to talk to you soon. Great, thank you all for the opportunity. It's amazing through um, this medium that we can be in touch with each other. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time. <laughs>